All right, we're on part four of the midterm study guide. So when you look at this map and we looked at those previous compromises, you can kind of see where the southern states were and where our slave states really are. Um, so you can see these areas, and New York is a slave state as of 1789. They'll eventually go ahead and do an abolishment. They'll make slavery illegal, but that's a major port where the slaves are coming in at. Um, so you can see why Virginia, which is a huge area at this point, it will eventually get cut up. But you can see where their issue was with, with slavery. And if you look at slave states versus free states, there are more slave states than there are free states. So a lot of people do go along with it. These areas up here were the ones who kind of resisted it and said, you know, if you're going to get slaves counting as representations, then we would like to have uh, taxes. Okay. So question 21 is how do we amend the Constitution and why is it so difficult to amend? Uh, we amend it by passing new amendments. So you have 27 amendments. So it's 27 times that we've actually amended the Constitution. That's a formal change. Most often we do informal changes to the United States Constitution and we do it through court cases. Uh, that's an easier way to do it. So how the court, how the Supreme Court of the United States um, interprets a law can amend the Constitution that way. It is meant to be difficult, though, in order to ensure the true free will of the people is being followed. So we're meant to, it's meant to be difficult to ensure that you and I really, really want the amendment. So this uh, picture over here is talking about women's rights, and it was our 19th Amendment, Women Finally Get Suffrage, um, and it was something that had actually been done out here in the West. Most of the states were actually allowing their females to go ahead and vote, and then as time goes on, you see the amendment, or you see this kind of like law kind of taking effect in other states, and eventually it'll become a United States Amendment that in federal elections, females can vote. The next question is question 22, and it asked you what did the Federalists promise to do for the Federalists, I mean for the Anti-Federalists, I'm sorry, in order for them to ratify the U.S. Constitution. Basically, they agreed to add those Bill of Rights. So here's your Bill of Rights. We went over it in class, um, and in the class you guys did the little pictures and stuff with it, okay? Just kind of make sure you know the Bill of Rights. Uh, just in general, you should know your rights that the government has provided for you, and the government cannot take away these rights. So when you look at a lot of these, there's historical reasons why the Founding Fathers decided to go ahead and put those in. You had the English Bill of Rights, so the Bill of Rights pretty much is kind of a copy of in a lot of ways. Um, and you had any, like, issues they had with England, they made certain they clarified it here in the Bill of Rights, like that no quartering of soldiers, you know, that was a big issue that they had, so they went ahead and they put that as a third amendment. You know, the fact that the tax collectors were coming through their home, well, you do the Fourth Amendment, no illegal searches or seizures of property, you got to have a search warrant, you know. So most of these actually have historical reasoning why the Founding Fathers are actually scared that the government might do something to them. All right, question 23 is how did the President, or how did President Washington's Secretary of Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, propose to fix economic problems that we were facing? So first thing first, Alexander Hamilton is the Secretary of Treasury. He is an economic genius. The man does know what he's doing. And so he says to the states, you guys are being burdened by the Revolutionary War debts. So what we're going to do as the federal government is we're going to take it all off your shoulders. We're going to put it on our shoulders. We will carry that burden for you. Some of the southern states hate this because they had already paid off their debt. Um, they didn't have as much as the northern half, which is pretty much where most of the American Revolutionary War was fought until the very end. So the southern states say, you know, this isn't right. We've been taxing our people. We've been paying off our debts. Um, and the northern states, are, you know, they're cheering in the streets because it means now everybody will help them pay off their debt because it won't be their debt. It'll be the U.S.'s debt. So there's some resistance there. The second party says, you know, because we got debt, we got to raise money, we got to have revenue. So he wants to create taxes and tariffs to pay off the new national debt. And this is because of that assumption of the state's debt. 
So, uh, you know, nobody likes taxes, uh, but he believes that he needs to do this, and so he's going to do one, like, on whiskey, and that's going to cause an issue. But tariffs are something else, too. Um, he wants to put a high tax on foreign goods. And why a high tax on foreign goods is to force the American people to buy the brand new northern made goods that are starting to be made up there. You know, they're starting their little factories, they're starting their manufacturing, and they need people to buy their products, but their products are a little bit higher than foreign goods. So he wants to make the foreign good the higher price one, forcing Americans to buy the American made good, which is going to keep those factories open, it's going to give them money, it's going to let them build up. So again, the North kind of likes that part. Okay, the South's not so much because they don't really make anything other than raw materials. Number three, he wants to create a national bank, and this is to ensure our financial stability. And remember, there is an explicit express power in the Constitution. It says the government has the power of the coin currency. So because of that coin currency money, he gets this implied power to make the bank. Um, so Jefferson just like, you know, he, he can't believe that Hamilton reads the Constitution this way. It's a loose interpretation of the Constitution. And so Hamilton and Jefferson are going at it. They, you read the letters that they sent to Washington. Um, so they're both trying to get Washington to go for their side, and Washington takes Hamilton's side. You know, he believes that this is going to allow our economy to be financially stable. And Jefferson, you know, leaves over that. So question 24 is, what did the creation of the National Bank cause? Hamilton really believes the necessary and proper clause, those implied powers, gives him the right to create this bank. Think about the necessary and proper clause, like this rubber band here. You can expand it, and you can shrink it back down as you see fit. That's the necessary and proper clause. But it doesn't let the government do anything and everything they want. There are limits. It is supposed to help them carry out the responsibilities of the government. They can't just, you know, create anything out of thin air. It has to be a power that's in there, in the U.S. Constitution, that they get the power derived from, okay? But Jefferson thinks that this necessary and proper clause is way too loose. You know, you're not actually reading the Constitution right, so he believes that what he's doing is illegal, and we get the two-party system being created thanks to the National Bank and the interpretation of how you read that Constitution. So Jefferson is a strict interpreter. If it's not written, it, can be not, it can't be done. Hamilton is a loose interpreter. If you dream it, you can do it, you know, because there's this necessary and proper clause. Question 25 is, what incident showed that the new nation was strong enough to withstand conflict under the U.S. Constitution, and what incident proved that the Articles of Confederation needed to be replaced? For your U.S. Constitution, it's the Whiskey Rebellion. There's an excise tax placed on whiskey. The corn farmers in Pennsylvania rebel. They yell out, no taxation without representation. And Hamilton advises Washington, enforce the tax. Make them pay it. And Washington's all for it. You know, he is gathering a militia. He is going to go to Pennsylvania and enforce the tax. The rebels put down their arms. They go home. But what it proves is that the government will enforce its laws. It proves that the U.S. Constitution is strong, that it is a good government because it prevailed. The Articles of Confederation, um, the thing that showed it needed to be replaced was back there in, you know, the Air 3, Shays' Rebellion. So at this time, you got another guy who's protesting about taxes, and it turns violent. But there is no government that can put it down. You know, there's no standing military under the Articles. There's no executive. And so when the states ask for help, the national government's like, I don't know what to do. You know, you guys figure that out. So the Articles of Confederation is proven weak by Shays' Rebellion. The U.S. Constitution is proven strong because of Whiskey Rebellion. Question 26 is asking you to compare the stands taken by Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson on a couple key issues. Key issue one, political party. Alexander Hamilton is the founder of the Federalist Party. He does it during Washington's administration. Thomas Jefferson is the founder of the Democrat-Republican Party. Of course, they have other people that work with him and help him. 
Um, how they interpret the Constitution, key issue two. Hamilton is a loose interpreter. Thomas Jefferson is a strict interpreter. Hamilton is a dreamer. Thomas Jefferson is a literal guy. If it's not written, you can't do it. The National Bank. Um, Alexander Hamilton, obviously, because he is the creator of the bank, is all for it. And he feels it is necessary and proper for our economic stability to have this bank. Thomas Jefferson, on the other hand, is against it because he believes it's reading too much into the United States Constitution, way too much. And so he gathers followers, and then you get your political party. Now, your foreign ties. Alexander Hamilton actually liked the British government. Not ruling them, but in general, he liked the British government. It actually was a strong central government. When they made rules, they could enforce it. So he kind of favors the British government, and he does favor sides with Britain. But, of course, you know, we won't take any sides of foreign matters because it's too much. It, it, it would be a financial strain, and he, he understands that. Thomas Jefferson favors the French. He favors France. They're a brand-new republic, or they're trying to be a brand-new republic, just like the United States. And so when you look at the foreign, like, connections between those two, uh, you just see... One, Thomas Jefferson kind of going for people who there's a similarity in. You know, the, the French people are fighting a monarchy for freedom, just like we did. There's that kind of common trend. But when you look at Hamilton, there is this common heritage w that we have with the British. So question 27 is, what were the two main warnings from Washington's farewell address. He has quite a few, but here are the two that North Carolina really likes you guys to know. Do not join foreign alliances. You know, stay neutral, stay isolated. So this is going to pretty much be America's foreign policy for a really long time. Remember what I tell you, everybody kind of asks, you know, what would Washington do? And so most people are going to stay neutral and isolated as our foreign policy for a while. Number two, he says, do not form political parties, but remain uh, united as Americans. He does not want us to form and divide ourselves. Uh, it, of course, he's too late. It happened during his administration, but he is advising people, don't don't continue on this path. So if you look at the United States today, we definitely have a two-party system. We have the Democrats and the Republicans. And if you look at our current alliance system, you know, here, all these dark blue is NATO. Uh, and that's the North Atlantic Treaty Organization that the United States uh, was one of the founding members of. Okay? And that was Cold War, and it's continued today. You'll learn more about it in American, too. But you can see a lot of alliances in, in the world. If we get attacked, they have to help the other blue people. Okay, And that's what happened on 9-11. All right, so number 28, what laws did John Adams pass to limit the power of the Democrat-Republican Party? And what was the purpose of these laws? The Alien and Sedition Acts are passed to stop the criticism of Adams' administration. The people who are criticizing this Federalist president are the Democrat Republicans, led by his own VP, Thomas Jefferson. So you got the Democrat Republicans pretty much owning and operating all the newspapers. They're publishing things that um, are kind of damaging to the Adams administration. And so he goes ahead and he does the Sedition Act can't criticize the government. Yes, it's a violation of the First Amendment. Then he does the Alien Act, and this is just going to increase the amount of years it takes to be a U.S. citizen. A lot of the new immigrants, the aliens, that's what they called them by then, are joining the Democrat-Republican Party. So he's made it where they're not going to be able to vote in the next election, and they're not going to be able to vote for a while. He's also limited the Democrat-Republican's power. The purpose is to stop any opposition to the Federalist-led government by John Adams. Now, what was the Democrat-Republicans' party's response to these laws, and uh, what did it propose? They do the Virginia-Kentucky resolutions. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison uh, write this, and it basically states that states can strike out, nullify, void, cancel any federal law that they don't like. It introduces the concept of nullification. And you're going to see this pop up a couple more times in American History 1. We're going to see it in 1832 with a tariff, and we're going to see it again in the election of 1860 with Abraham Lincoln.